Colby Chaos Covington didn't get his name for nothing. Being one of the most polarizing athletes of all time, it seems that everywhere Colby Covington goes results in a whirlwind of controversy, whether he's shamelessly bashing an entire country on pay-per-view TV, saying Kamaru Usman's late coach will be watching him from hell, or calling his haters nerds and virgins. Greetings, nerds and virgins. It's pretty easy to develop a hatred for this guy. Despite how you may feel about the verbal tornado that is Colby Covington, there is no denying that he is one of the greatest welterweight fighters in the world. With a gas tank that never seems to run out and the ability to make guys quit with his nonstop pressure, you can't not respect Covington as a fighter. While you may know him for his infuriating trash talk and reckless behavior, what you may not know is that Covington, like many UFC greats, started his combat sports journey with wrestling. Before we start, be sure to hit subscribe. Colby Covington was born in Clovis, California, and at the age of eight, his family moved to Oregon. His father, Brad Covington, was a college wrestler back in his day and naturally got Colby involved. Colby saw tons of success through his elementary and middle school days, which carried over into his high school career. Wrestling for Thurston High School in Springfield, Oregon, Covington became one of the most successful wrestlers to come through the program. He lettered all four years and was a two-time conference champion, and won the 2006 state championships at 171 pounds, finishing with a career record of 118 and 34 with 58 pins. As if that wasn't enough, he also set the school record for most takedowns in a single season with 228. Colby saw success on the national stage as well, becoming a two-time Fargo All-American in both freestyle and Greco. With all of his success, Colby was one of the nation's top recruits and was set to wrestle for Arizona State, but his test scores prevented him from getting into school. Because of this, Covington was forced to wrestle at Iowa Central Community College. Funny enough, he wasn't the only UFC star to come out of that program, with his roommate being John Bone Jones. In his true freshman year, Covington demolished the 165 field. Going 34-0 on the season, Covington won the JUCO National Championships. With his grades in a better spot and his wrestling ability obviously still at an elite level, he began to get recruited at the Division I level again. After his stellar freshman year, he transferred to Iowa with a full ride. Covington redshirted his first year as a Hawkeye, but ran into a major setback outside of the wrestling room. On August 10, 2007, Covington was arrested for eluding the police and driving under the influence. As a result, he was suspended from the wrestling team for the rest of the year. When asked about it, Covington said, That was a real all-time low, and something I wish I could take back. While Covington may regret his decision, this wouldn't be the last time he found himself in hot water. In the following season, Colby didn't see too much time on the mat. While he did win the Flash Flanagan and Grandview Opens, he only wrestled in three duel meets and finished the season 9-2. While things didn't seem to be going the way he'd expected, Colby's luck was about to take a turn for the better. In 2009, former Iowa coach Jim Zaleski convinced Colby to come wrestle for him at Oregon State. Being from Oregon, Covington jumped on the opportunity to go back home, saying, It's a different feeling getting to represent them. There's a lot of pride and honor in that. Heading back home seemed to be the right call for Covington. In his first year as a Beaver, he was ranked as high as 7th in the country at 174 pounds, placed 4th at Midlands despite coming into the tournament unseated, and won his first Pac-10 championship, helping Oregon State win the team title as well. Coming into NCAAs as the 8th seed and riding a 17-match win streak, Covington unfortunately lost in the blood round, finishing the tournament 2-2. Two Despite the heartbreaking end to the season, Covington made a tremendous impact on the team, earning the team's most outstanding wrestler award, had the most pins on the season with 15, and also won the leadership award. While it seemed that Covington had turned over a new leaf and was getting his head on straight, that was all spoiled on May 23, 2010. After a verbal altercation, Colby had punched two men in the face and was arrested and charged with fourth-degree assault. Luckily for Covington, the DA office decided to drop the charges which seemed to be a wake-up call, because he soon became laser-focused for his final wrestling season. At the 2010 Cliff Keen Las Vegas tournament, he came into it as the fifth seed. Losing to Oklahoma's Tyler Caldwell in the quarters by a score of 6-0, Covington put the loss behind him and stormed back for third. He also claimed his second Pac-10 title and was seeded fourth at the 2011 NCAA tournament, where he placed fifth. While his sights were set on a national title, he is still proud of his All-American status, telling UFC.com that it is his most prestigious accomplishment. After graduating with a degree in sociology in 2011, 
Covington was recruited by American Top Team co-founder Dan Lambert to help coach wrestling. It wasn't long before Covington packed his bags and made the move to South Florida. Shortly after he got there, Covington realized he still had a craving for competition and decided to start his own MMA career. Fighting in the local professional MMA circuit, Covington accrued a five-fight win streak over the course of three years. Despite not having a ton of professional experience, Covington was offered a contract from the UFC and made his debut in August of 2014 against An Ying Wang coming off of two TKOs of his own. Wang was a pretty decent first fight for the upcoming Covington. Despite all of the hype around Wang, Covington made his presence in the UFC known by earning a TKO in the closing seconds of the first round. Covington continued his dominance by beating Wagner Silva by submission three months later followed by a unanimous decision over Mike Piles a few months after that. It wasn't until December of 2015 that Covington got his first taste of adversity. Fighting with a fractured rib, Covington was submitted in the first round by Worley Alves. This was Covington's first professional loss, and it lit a fire inside of him. He knew what he was capable of if he was healthy. He had aspirations of being the best in the world and knew he wasn't going to get a shot at a belt by getting submitted in less than 90 seconds. After that, Colby went on an absolute tear. He took out Jonathan Munye by submission, Max Griffin by TKO, and beat both Brian Barberina and Dong Yun Kim by unanimous decision. Despite having a 12-1 record, Covington found his career in jeopardy. His fight with Damian Maya, the UFC said that no matter the outcome, they would not extend his contract making this one of the most important fights of his career. At the time, Covington was still relatively respectful and polite in the public eye, but while he may have been a great competitor, he wasn't putting people in the stands. I mean, let's be frank. Nobody really wants to pay to watch a well-mannered white guy wrestle people to a decision. And let's look at it from the UFC's perspective as well. Covington may be talented, but they're running a business, one centered around entertainment for that matter. If he's not making the UFC any money, then there's no point in keeping him around. Take a look at some of the biggest names in sports. Almost all of them have at least a little controversy behind them. Conor McGregor, Antonio Brown, and even Gable Stevenson. While they're great at what they do, the casual fan knows them for their trash talk and bringing excitement to their sports. With MMA being relatively new to the sports world, the UFC needed fighters that would draw in more casual fans. And what do people love more than some good old fashioned drama? So Colby had a decision to make either continue to uphold his sportsmanlike reputation and risk losing the career he'd worked his whole life for, or feed into the demon on his shoulder and give the audience what they wanted, chaos. Covington walked into Damian Maia's home country of Brazil and absolutely dominated. At the end of the 15 minutes, Covington had handily won the fight by unanimous decision. The announcement of his win brought booze from the Brazilian crowd, and this is where the Colby Covington we know today was born. Practically taking the mic from Daniel Cormier, Covington yelled, I should have knocked him out! Brazil, you're a dog! All you filthy animals suck! Then proceeded to call out Tyrone Woodley, the welterweight champion at the time. The chaos caused by Covington's outburst was severe to say the least. He immediately started getting death threats from the Brazilian fans, one even posing as a journalist trying to get into his hotel room. His Brazilian teammates at American Top Team refused to train with him, and he was turned into the villain of the MMA world. The old saying, any publicity is good publicity, rang true for Covington. He went from being the guy that was always in the background to one of the biggest names in MMA. He decided to keep piling on the dickhead persona he had made for himself and did everything he could to rile up his opponents and UFC fans alike. From obnoxiously spewing his political views online, sporting MAGA hats everywhere he went, walking around with a posse of swimsuit models he had obviously paid for, and calling all of his haters nerds and virgins. He even once said that if he beat Tyrone Woodley for the welterweight title, that he would go to Washington, D.C. and give his championship belt to Donald Trump. Covington's antics had major implications in his personal life, with nobody wanting to be associated with him. At the time, he was close friends with Jorge Masvidal, but he had completely ruined that relationship. Masvidal even put out a video showing the decline of their friendship on his YouTube channel, saying, I know who he is in real life. He's not the character he's trying to be. It's crazy to see what people will do literally for the dollar. They will sell their soul. Despite the negativity surrounding his name, Covington got what he wanted. He got to keep his job. While all of this was happening, he would constantly call out Tyrone Woodley. He even went so far as to set up a pro wrestling match where he faced an overweight black man named Tyquil Woodley. <laughs> uh, let me say that. A joke on how boring Woodley's style was. While he may have been pushing the envelope a bit too far, and some would say he was making a fool of himself, he didn't allow himself to get distracted. He kept training like a madman for a shot at the UFC welterweight title. Colby would finally get his chance at a belt in June of 2018. While it wasn't against the man he'd been foaming at the mouth of the face, Tyrone Woodley, who was out with a shoulder injury, 
Covington had arguably the best fighter he'd faced in his entire career thus far. Rafael Dos Anjos from Brazil. A former Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion, Dos Anjos was known for his kicking ability and his gas tank. With it being his first five round fight, a lot of speculation revolved around if Covington would be able to last the full 25 minutes. When it came down to it, Covington silenced all of the nerds and virgins by technically picking Dos Anjos apart. Colby did what he does best and kept the pressure up the whole fight, smothering Dos Anjos against the cage and showing his wrestling prowess by continually getting to his leg attacks. Covington won the fight by unanimous decision, being named the UFC interim welterweight champion and finally getting to wear the belt he couldn't shut up about. After one of his most impressive performances to date, it seemed like he had earned a little respect back from the UFC and fans. You would think that after a 25 minute war with one of the best fighters in the world, he wouldn't have the energy to tarnish his reputation even further. But this is Colby Covington we're talking about, and he quickly found a way to ruin the moment. After giving Joe Rogan a kiss on the cheek, he told the crowd that he would be fulfilling his promise he had made just seven months ago by going to the White House and giving his belt to the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Shortly after expressing his intense patriotism, he went on to do his two favorite things in the world, making racist comments about Brazilians and bashing Tyrone Woodley. Unfortunately for Covington, his glory as a UFC interim welterweight champion was short-lived. After having to undergo nasal surgery and not being able to unify the title against Woodley, Covington's belt was stripped. In order to get another shot at the welterweight title, Covington had to go through former UFC welterweight champion Robbie Lawler. Taking the fight on four weeks notice, Covington shocked the MMA world by demoralizing the former champion. He even broke the record for most strikes thrown in a single fight with 541. After a long and painful road, Covington finally would get his shot at the UFC welterweight title in December of 2019. He would square off against Kamaru Usman, who had defeated Tyrone Woodley for the belt in March of that year. Fans were excited for this matchup since both Covington and Usman were known for their wrestling. Despite that, Covington told Submission Radio that he wasn't worried about Usman because he's never been in a fight where he can't take the guy down, and dogged him for being a Division II wrestler in college. The fight lived up to the hype, mainly coming down to striking since both of them were such good wrestlers. Heading into the fifth round, the judges had the score tied. That's when Usman poured it on, eventually earning a TKO by punches. It would be nine months before the Octagon saw Covington again. This time he was squaring off against the man he had sought after for nearly three years, Tyrone Woodley. With numerous disses and verbal attacks between the two over the course of their careers, every UFC fan was ecstatic that this fight was finally happening. Unfortunately for fans and Covington alike, we did not get to see a fine-tuned Tyrone Woodley. He seemed slower and weaker than what he was capable of, and Covington controlled the fight, earning a TKO via rib injury in the fourth round. While the result of his fight with Woodley may have been lackluster, it got Colby back where he wanted, the UFC welterweight title fight in a rematch with Kamaru Usman. Party fake newsman, Street Judas, we got unfinished business. There's nowhere to run and there's nowhere to hide. I'm coming for you. You're not! Nearly two years after their first meeting, tensions were extremely high heading into the bout. Even at the pre-fight press conference, both Usman and Covington exchanged trash talk, with Usman even shoving Covington during the face-offs. When the fight began, Covington seemed to take a more reserved approach, which eventually backfired with Usman taking the first round and knocking him down twice in round two. As the fight progressed, Covington's gas tank and high tempo started to take a toll on Usman, but it was to no avail. Usman had successfully defended his UFC welterweight title, sending Covington home empty-handed once again. Despite the disappointment and how quick Covington is to throw out insults and excuses, he handled the loss with grace and humility, crediting Usman for his performance and quickly getting out of the octagon. Could we be seeing a change Colby Covington? Well, hopefully no one got their hopes up because Covington's next opponent would be former best friend turned foe, Jorge Masvidal. As I mentioned earlier, Masvidal and Covington used to be best friends. They trained together at American Top Team and lived in the same apartment. Things between the two of them began to turn sour when Covington started his antics back in 2017. But what put the nail in the coffin was when, according to Masvidal, Covington didn't pay Masvidal's striking coach, Alino Hernandez. Covington denied the accusations on submission radio, even claiming that he has receipts to prove it. The beef between the two got so bad that Covington eventually left American Top Team after nine years, making them move to MMA Masters in Miami. The hatred these two have for each other was put on full display in the pre-fight press conference. Covington and Masvidal argued like siblings in the backseat of a car, with the media hardly able to get a question out before the bickering would resume. Knowing each other's styles so well, the first two rounds were like the world's most violent chess match. 
While it looked like Masvidal was going to be able to make something happen after a solid second round, the biggest game changer in the bout proved to be Covington's wrestling ability. Taking Masvidal down multiple times, Covington was able to impose his will on top, exhausting Masvidal not only physically, but mentally. And of course, the highly anticipated rivalry wouldn't be complete without a healthy amount of chirping from both Covington and Masvidal, including a tasteful nut grab from Covington at the end of the fight. Covington's dominance earned him the unanimous decision, and his post-fight interview was surprisingly more tame than expected as well, limiting his insults to only calling Masvidal Miami street trash. It has now been over a year since Colby Covington has seen the inside of a cage but that could change here in the very near future. After two straight wins over Kamaru Usman, Leon Edwards is now the reigning UFC welterweight champion. Following UFC 286 in March of 2023, Dana White confirmed that Edwards' next opponent will be none other than Colby Covington. While a date hasn't been set yet, I, as well as many other fans I'm sure, can't wait to see the chaos unfold when Covington gets another shot at the title. If you enjoyed that video, be sure to drop a like and comment below what we should cover next. See you next time.